Hey, I'd like to welcome all you guys to Augustus 5 for a speech called Thunderbolt, Adventures in Thunderbolt DMA Attacks by Russ Savinsky. Hope you guys are excited about this as I am. It's going to be a great talk. I'm going to turn it over to Russ. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, again, my name is Russ Savinsky. I'm a, a security researcher with ISEC Partners. I'm also a father, a husband, and a musician. I love learning. I love taking stuff apart, figuring out how it works. Um, and I feel like that's the best way to really learn something. Um, I feel like going through contrived labs and kind of leading you down to the answer um, is great on learning um, a specific um, technology, but it's, it's not the way to kind of get a, a great grasp of, of what you're looking at. So I just like taking stuff apart. That's kind of what I do. So um, that's why we're here today. We're here to talk about um, the Thunderbolt technology, uh, going through a practical reverse engineering exercise um, of Thunderbolt, and also looking at how it relates to DMA attacks. So um, I focus primarily on Apple hardware. So the Intel stuff I strayed away from, mostly because uh, there were some uh, bigger mitigations on the Intel stuff. The, uh, the Apple stuff's not quite there yet, so um, we're going to kind of focus on Apple specifically. So in order to get a deeper understanding of uh, what we um, are looking at, we are going to need some background information. So just at a high level, we need to know what is Thunderbolt and what is DMA. We mentioned that was the goal. Uh, was a Thunderbolt DMA attack. So what is Thunderbolt and what is DMA? Um, Thunderbolt is Apple and Intel's joint effort to combine a high-speed data bus and display port all on one expansion port. So no more having to get an HDMI cable and then a USB 3 cable. It, it's all on one expansion port. Um, the basis, it funnels down into PCI Express. So already we're starting to kind of pick out some technologies we're going to need to start looking at. So PCI Express being one. Um, since we're focusing on DMA, uh, we're going to stick primarily to the um, uh, serial uh, data speed connection. So what is DMA? Uh, it stands for direct memory access. And back in the day, um, when a device needed to access memory, uh, it did something what's called programmed I.O. And so what happened was the a device would contact the processor. Processor um, would take the address that it wanted. It was stored in a register. Then it would go fetch that memory, come back, and so the, the processor was the bottleneck. The, the processor, or not the bottleneck, the the middleman. Um, and as the processor became faster, devices still stayed slow. So the processor would have to wait around for the request to be finished by the device, and it just was a horrible performance hit. So. What the engineers decided to do was, well, let's just have the device contact the memory directly and allow the processor to continue on doing what it needs to do. So that was the solution. So just thinking about that, why would these external buses matter uh, for us as security experts? Well, I mean, the biggest reason is if I have uh, direct access to your memory externally, um, on an external bus on the computer, that sounds pretty serious. Uh, there's some, um, you know, RAM consequences that I can I can pull memory out. So um, users uh, may be affected. Another thing is the field of digital forensics. Um, we have a problem to solve. We have a mystery we want to solve, and we have a, a bad guy's laptop that has full disk encryption, and we need to get the encryption key off so we can start to solve this mystery. We can use um, these types of accesses to grab those keys out of memory. Uh, and also digital rights management. Um, we, can pull, um, we can pull information off of the bus, but uh, manufacturers might use bus encryption. They may encrypt that, that traffic going back and forth, so that makes it difficult for us to, to check that out. So those are some main reasons why external buses matter. Uh, current DMA research, obviously I'm not the first one to ever be doing DMA attacks. Um, so uh, the, there's a paper or a presentation called I.O. Attacks and in Intel Architectures and Countermeasures. This presentation is great. It goes through all of the types of I.O. attacks that can be done and talks about DMA and gets uh, really low level into a lot of stuff. So I highly recommend that uh, presentation for those um, who want to see that. Also understanding DMA malware is a great paper. Uh, it goes through the way you can take um, a DMA 
you could take uh, information and put it onto Intel's ME um, platform, and you can actually run uh, Keylogger uh, in, on the hardware itself. So, uh, pretty interesting. Current Thunderbolt attacks, we're talking about Thunderbolt, so we should probably figure out if that's even possible. Um, it is possible. DMA attacks through Thunderbolt are definitely possible, and they're, they exist. They're, they're easy to do. So, the way you would do that is uh, currently you would um, daisy chain um, Thunderbolt through Firewire, and you would use a program called Inception. And Inception allows you to um, perform DMA attacks through Firewire. It's based off the Lib Forensics 1394 uh, Python library, and it allows you to run a DMA attack through Firewire. You, thunder, uh, you daisy chain that through Thunderbolt, and now you can pull off uh, PCI DMA attacks through Firewire, daisy chain to Thunderbolt. So, also the De Mysteries Dob Javsivs. I'm sorry to snare if I pronounced that incorrectly, but this paper was awesome. This was basically a Mac uh, EFI rootkit. So we're going to talk about this process a little later, but um, when, your, when your computer boots up and your PCI Express bus goes to enumerate everything, it pulls expansion ROMs from devices. And on those um, expansion ROMs, you can put an EFI program and that will execute on the device before the operating system even loads. So that is a great way to get um, rootkits in. So mitigations to a lot of this stuff, I mean, this, this is sounding pretty scary. Um, epoxy. You can always glue your ports shut. Uh, no one can get into your ports and steal your memory, but now you can't use your ports. So uh, maybe we can think of something a little better. How about an input output memory management unit, an IOMMU? Uh, think of these as virtual memory for your devices. So your device uh, plugs in, it actually gets a virtual memory address. The virtual memory address is translated to the physical memory address through the IOMMU uh, hardware. And also this, so this not only gives you an abstraction layer between your memory uh, with virtual memory, but it also allows you to set up um, almost like access controls for uh, sections of memory and for devices. So you can lock these down um, from accessing certain types of memories. Um, also secure configurations. You, um, Apple has some configurations that you can do to prevent the firewire attacks um, while the computer is locked. Uh, the problem with that is the computer, if the person's logged in, then the attack is still available. So this still doesn't stop social engineering attacks from, hey, this, my device isn't quite working on my laptop. Can I just try it on yours real quick, see if, if I can get that squared away? Um, so these, these attacks definitely exist. And so it turns out that there is a way for us to bypass memory and continue on with our research. So DMA stuff is um, definitely prevalent in Thunderbolt. Uh, so in order for us to get through reverse engineering, we're going to need to get down to some of the underlying protocols we were talking about, PCI Express being the main one. Uh, we mentioned that PCI Express um, is kind of the underlying bus structure that funnels down from Thunderbolt. So um, we're going to need to understand that a little better. So this is going to be a crash course in PCI Express. Um, this uh, specification is a beast, so uh, I'll try and go as quick as I can and get through this. Um, uh, if, if we run out of time and there's no time for questions, uh, come and see me afterwards and we can go through it a little more. Uh, so PCI Express, it's a high-speed data bus. Um, uh, it's, it's serial, so no longer using parallel anymore. Uh, data is uh, uh, sent via lanes, and so a lane is made up of um, two simplex lines, uh, two simplex uh, data, data paths, one um, transmit, one receive, and then each of those is made up of uh, two differential pairs. A differential pair is uh, one signal going uh, positive and then another signal the exact opposite going negative. And what happens is when the two signals get to the device, they compare the difference. And this is really great for interference. If interference happens on the, the lines, um, it should affect both lines. And so you can just take the difference and pull that out. Um, and obviously we have the transmit and receive pairs. So those four lines will make up a single lane or uh, by one PCI Express. Um, per the PCI SIG specification, you, the minimum amount of wires needed for PCI Express is four. A uh, single lane PCI Express only needs four wires. I thought that was really interesting. Um, a reference clock uh, is optional. It's not required and you can get away with a 2.5 gigahertz oscillator um, with plus or minus 300 ppm. So um, when we're doing our reverse engineering, most manufacturers will do six wire. 
just because it's easier to throw in um, a reference clock and it makes it a little more stable. Uh, but PCI Express can definitely handle without one. Um, different device types. We have endpoints, switches and hubs, or I'm sorry, switches and bridges and uh, the root complex. So endpoints um, are basically your devices. You have a legacy device and our legacy endpoint and a native endpoint. Native endpoints are what's coming out nowadays, 64-bit um, uh, addressing. There's a little bit of um, permissions that are kind of locked down to which memory locations you can and can't do. Uh, legacy devices, on the other hand, allow you to actually do um, I.O. reads and writes. Um, as well as memory reads and writes. You can also do what are called locked transactions, which means um, you can lock the bus while you're using it and no other devices can use the bus. Um, back to the PCI days, that was important for um, bus arbitration. Um, more per, um, and so moving on, the um, data is sent over packets, uh, similar, to, it's analogous to TCP IP. Um, they are called transaction layer packets or TLPs. Um, it also uses a point-to-point -point, uh, topology, so there's no more bus arbitration like we talked about earlier in the PCI days. Uh, you'd have to set a line high to um, request access and another line would go high when you get, you were granted permission from the arbitrator. This isn't the case. You can just use the bus whenever you need to use the bus. Uh, native devices aren't allowed to lock it, so other devices can use it. Legacy devices can lock the bus. Um, and packets are routed by address. This is sounding a lot like uh, TCP IP, but this is memory address. And so what will happen is devices will travel through the PCI Express fabric and uh, based on their address, um, it will get routed to the correct device. Peer-to-peer -peer, um, communication is also possible because of this. We give an address of the device that we want to talk to, it will travel through and get to it. Uh, any memory addresses that are RAM based are going through the root complex. So the root complex it is a logical grouping of, um, the, of circuitry that will connect uh, the PCI Express bus to the CPU and memory. Uh, I say logical because there's multiple ways to implement this. You can implement this um, on your north bridge directly. You can implement this as a separate chipset. You can implement this as, as multiple chipsets. Uh, it all depends uh, on the manufacturer what they want to do. So in this image you can see the root complex being in the center. Um, also notice the switch that has a bunch of uh, devices hooked up to it. So in that example if a, uh, the device on the left wanted to contact the device on the right it would send out a TLP with the address of that device, it would get to the switch and the switch would say, oh, I have that over on this port. I'm going to send it out here. It doesn't even need to traverse up to the root complex. Um, also with bridges, legacy devices can send um, old school packets through. They'll get tra translated into the correct uh, protocol and sent through. Um, so we talked about this a little bit earlier with the Mac EFI rootkit paper. Um, devices um, are enumerated through an enumeration process for PCI Express. So we start out um, a bus zero, device zero, function zero. Bus zero is most always your root complex. So we start at the root complex, we start at the very first device and the very first function and we say, is there anyone there? Uh, if a device comes back and says, yes, I'm here, then the next question is, are you a uh, bridge or are you an endpoint? If it's a bridge, it'll go down and traverse down through that bridge and start the process all over again, enumerating all the devices there. If it's an endpoint, it'll uh, tag it with an ID and an address and it'll pull information from its PCI expansion ROM and load it into the configuration space. Um, if it's a hot plug device and you've already booted up the machine, you just plug in that hot plug device and there's two wires, present one and present two. These get um, these get connected and now the enumeration process happens but just for that one port. It doesn't happen through the whole bus all over again. Uh, the expansion ROMs on the devices are what stores this information. So when you plug in, you get an ID and an address, uh, you, start a new, uh, you start pulling that information from uh, device ROMs. So that was PCI Express. <laughs> um, now as far as reverse engineering all of this, um, I love taking stuff apart. I am not a professional reverse engineer. I just love looking at stuff. I love learning. So I just like taking stuff apart. I don't have um, the, the best equipment, but what I do have got me a, a long way. So I'd like to just share that with uh, some of the uh, EEs out there and, and uh, maybe some of the hobbyists who want to get into some of this stuff. Uh, some of the tools that I used, um, a multimeter. A uh, multimeter is amazing, especially for the continuity testing feature. We're able to touch different wires together and, um, and different traces and different vias and trace where signal is flowing. 
Uh, for those who aren't familiar, a via is a way for, and we'll kind of kind of touch on this in a little bit, a via is a way for um, a PCB layer at top to talk to a PCB layer further down and vice versa. So if I have a PCB and I have a layer up top and I have a layer on the bottom, um, and a, a via will allow me to drop down and do that. That makes the, um, the board development process really easy for manufacturers because they don't have to try and keep all of their designs constrained to one side. Um, and then you have a list of usual suspects. You got your solder station, heat gun, reflow stuff, desoldering tools for heating up the board, um, and desoldering chips, uh, soldering things. Um, those all come in really handy. An ethernet cable. Ethernet cable, not because we're going to be doing any ethernet stuff, but if you cut this, one of two things will happen. You can get the, um, one of the eight wires, just take that and you, um, if it's a solid wire, you can wrap those around your multimeter and now your multimeter is that much smaller and you can get into areas uh, that you couldn't with big bulky uh, multimeter uh, leads. Also the other thing, if the, um, as we'll see a little early or a little later, um, the wires, if they're made up of strands, you can take that strand out and cut it and you can actually solder into those vias that we talked about earlier and start sniffing some of the traffic on there. Epoxy, epoxy again, epoxy is quickly becoming my favorite reverse engineering tool uh, for this stuff. Uh, I picked this tip up from a buddy of mine, Mike Warner. Uh, we would take apart uh, USB thumb drives uh, for, because the case was too big and it wouldn't fit and then we would just put epoxy over everything to keep it solid. Epoxy is not conductive so we don't have to worry about electronics shorting out and it's a great protector. Um, the other thing it can do is if you have really small leads and you want to get some wires on there, if you're if you're just right and you put enough pressure on there, you can push the wires on there and glue them together. So you can actually glue the wires um, with epoxy directly to the leads and do some sniffing as well. Uh, logic analyzer, this is crucial for figuring out what's going on on the board, what uh, protocols are being used, uh, what buses are, are sending data when. And an image editor, um, I use GIMP because it's free. And, um, but you can use anything. This is great for taking an image of the board, taking an image of the other side of the board, and then comparing in the image editor by flipping and watching where leads go. Uh, so this is a really great way to, um, to reverse engineer. Uh, so let's go through the process. This is the process I took for reverse engineering uh, the Thunderbolt technology. So just <clears throat> pick a product and we'll take it apart. We're going to locate the important ICs on this chip. We're going to um, locate all of the wires that connect to all of them and see how they're interconnected. Then we'll look for data sheets for all of those chips, figure out what those pins are actually set up for and what they're meant to do. And then we'll sniff those buses and develop a map of our Thunderbolt technology and how it all works. So I chose two devices. Uh, the first device was the um, Buffalo Mini Station uh, Thunderbolt USB 3 hard drive. This has a really great form factor for reverse engineering this kind of stuff. It's, it's nice and big. Um, it has really, um, it has really, I'm, I'm going to say big because it's in, it's big in comparison to the other device I chose, but um, it has a um, big area for vias to solder in and you can see the chips clearly. It's, it's a really great form factor for that kind of stuff. Um, it also has USB 3, which I thought would be a really interesting attack if we can start uh, tweaking some of these chips and pulling information out uh, through TLP packets and writing those uh, to our USB 3 thumb drive. I mean, obviously it's a hard drive, but if we want to put some more um, malicious um, technology in this device and take that hard drive out, um, we could put a USB 3 thumb drive in there and route it. So that, that we we're just kind of thinking out loud, that might be a really cool attack scenario. Um, and the Apple Thunderbolt to gigabit ethernet adapter. This thing was a nightmare to reverse engineer. These things are, are tiny. I mean, and, and with good reason. I mean, you, you want consumers to have a nice quick adapter they can plug in and go. Um, and they look nice, you know, so that, that's, that, that's why they're super small. But it doesn't make it nice for us as reverse engineers to look at this stuff, so. So we'll start with the hard drive. Um, a non-tech has an amazing teardown of this high-res images. Um, really detailed information on it and they've also um, picked out all of the ICs for us. So that part of the um, reverse engineering is done. We already know all the chips on there, all the interesting ones anyways. Uh, the main ones on there, the uh, MLDU3, uh, that's the USB to SATA controller 
And so just thinking about this as a hard drive, we know we're going to have SATA connecting to our hard drive. We have USB 3 and Thunderbolt as the input. So now looking at the chips, we have a USB 3 to SATA controller. So we start building our two paths, one for USB 3 down to SATA and one to Thunderbolt down to SATA. And this chip kind of solves that mystery. It's USB 3 to controller, controller to SATA. We're done. So that leg is pretty much taken care of with that chip. We also have an ASM 1061. This is the PCI Express to SATA controller. Again, Thunderbolt based on PC, uh, using PCI Express, uh, you can start building that path out now. It's, you know, PCI Express to SATA and then some other technology up to the Thunderbolt controller, which leads us to our next chip, the DSL 2210. This is the Intel Thunderbolt chip. It's also code name is Peak Ridge. Um, it is going to be connected directly to the Thunderbolt controller and just kind of at a high level we can start seeing, okay, so Thunderbolt uh, connector, uh, controller, PCI Express SATA, hard drive. So we're starting to build that path out. So now we have the USB 3 path and the Thunderbolt path. And then we have an LPC 1114. It's a ARM Cortex processor. Um, not really quite sure what this is doing here. A non-tech thinks that it's to switch between USB 3 and SATA but we've already identified those paths and how they interact. So it, that's basically just um, setting wires high and, and voltages. So we really don't think that that's the solution, but we're not quite sure what that is yet. So we need to keep digging deeper. Here's an image of the front of the board. And as you can see, just uh, at visual inspection, you can start taking a look at some of these. Um, right there are our three, uh, three out of our four main ICs. The one on the upper left is our USB 3 controller. The one in the middle is our Thunderbolt controller. And the one on the right is our PCI Express controller. We also have um, a couple SPI ROMs that um, are on the board. Uh, excuse me. Visual inspection kind of says, okay, the one on the top left is going to be related to the USB 3 controller. The one in the, uh, the top right is going to be related to the PCI Express controller. So we can start picking out um, what ROMs we can start looking at. Also, we have some interesting header rows set up here. So these might be interesting. These may be JTAG uh, headers. They may be, um, I think it would be really crazy if there was a um, a root shell on a hard drive. Um, probably not the case, but we, we, you never know. So let's, uh, we'll keep those in our back pocket and kind of continue on. Flipping the board over, um, you notice we identify uh, the fourth chip, the ARM Cortex. Uh, any ROMs on this? We notice there's one over here. Visual inspection, just looking at this side, we don't see any chips around it. Although if we flip the board around, uh, in this image, you'll see a big grouping of resistors uh, right above that. And that's, the, uh, that's the bottom end of the Thunderbolt controller. So all those resistors being you know, pulled, uh, pulled high or pulled low uh, for power and such. So this may be the ROM for Thunderbolt. We're not quite sure. Uh, visual inspection doesn't show any direct vias to it. Uh, putting the board on its side, we notice this board only has three layers. So that's great for us as reverse engineers. Um, it'd be ideal if it was just two, but most manufacturers may do eight or nine. I mean, it all depends on, on how they're going to uh, design their boards. But this allows us to do most of our, our inspection visually. And if we have anything that's interesting that we can't quite find, a continuity tester will help us to resolve that. And since it's a single board in the middle, we shouldn't have to worry too much about speculation on where it's going. So let's start looking at our PCI Express controller. It's a PCI, excuse me, PCI Express to SATA controller. Um, we're going to try and look for some data sheets so we can figure out what's is going on and try to identify all the ROMs and flashes on it. This thing didn't have any direct uh, data sheets available. That stuff was kept confidential. It wasn't available on, on Google or, or Baidu or anything. What I was able to find, though, was a motherboard manufacturer thought it would be really great if they took all of the chips that they used and they made pinouts of them and put them in the user manual for their motherboard. So I was able to find the pinouts for the ASM 1061 by finding a motherboard um, user sheet, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, but in this, you can see, it might be hard to see from the image, the um, top middle is all of our PCI Express lines. So we can start mapping out where those are going based on our data sheet. Um, in looking at this image, you can see two nice, big, fat lanes coming down um, in between the um, PCI Express port and Thunderbolt. 
Uh, and also if you see there's a big fat one looping around on the side. Uh, looking at the data sheet we see that those are our PCI express lines. So there's our transmit and receive going um, up and down and then there's a reference clock coming over on the side. Uh, you may also notice that uh, there's two um, there's two crystals on this device. One for the P one for the PCI express one and also one going into Thunderbolt. Uh, and that would make sense because the Thunderbolt connector doesn't really have a, a reference clock and if, P if Thunderbolt's doing PCI express it's going to have a reference clock coming out to the AS media. So that's going to be a 2.5 gigahertz uh, reference clock and that's going to be traveling around on that, um, on that looping uh, lines down to the AS media. So already we're starting to build a map. We're starting to uh, build a pinout of Thunderbolt. Um, this is an image of the board, uh, the chip desoldered and me kind of tracing in some of the lines coming in with different colors. This is where our image editor comes in handy. So we've already identified seven of the pins for the Thunderbolt controller. Uh, all the PCI express uh, transmit stuff and also a PCI reset. Um, so maybe we can patch this ROM and do some DMA attacks through the PCI express ROM. This, although this in theory would be possible, turns out this ROM is actually a PCI express expansion ROM. So um, if, we can, if we can send out some malicious code on this, that's a possibility. Uh, but doing an actual DMA attack may not be the case with, with changing that. Um, also if we were able to find the flash um, on the ASM 1061, we could pull that off and possibly look for bugs in that and exploit those. But we're going to keep that in our back pocket um, and we're going to continue on looking for other things, kind of digging a little deeper. Um, now we move on to the LPC 1114. This is the ARM Cortex that we saw earlier. We're not quite sure what it's used for. Um, this model of ARM has tons of information online, so finding a data sheet is not a problem. Um, it does connect directly to Thunderbolt though. Uh, and how do I know that? I'm able to just by visual inspection check out the lines coming out and they kind of drop into vias in this pattern. If we continue looking on flipping the board on the other side, we can see those same vias popping up coming into Thunderbolt. Uh, so with our little image editing magic, maybe hard to see in this image, but we can kind of flop those two together and set a direct connection. So now that we have data sheets for our arm, let's go ahead and figure out what these are. Looks like two of them are I squared C. So for those who are not familiar, I squared C is a, um, a bus for transferring, uh, for two chips communicating with each other. So it looks like the arm and the Thunderbolt controller are communicating via I squared C. We can add those two pins to our pinout for Thunderbolt. Um, next we'll move on to Thunderbolt, a DSL 2210. This has no data sheets available online. It's promotional information only. Um, maybe we could find some ROMs and flashes. We noticed there was that one uh, ROM sitting on the other side. Um, this is where our continuity testing comes in handy. We're able to do our continuity test from the SPI lines on the ROM into some lines going into Thunderbolt. And so those are traveling on the middle plane. So we're able to find out this definitely is the ROM for Thunderbolt. So not only do we know we have some code we can look at, we also know that we have four more pins that we can add to our list of um, pins for Thunderbolt. Um, and so we kind of do this process. We start developing this map of, of how all these things are working together. Um, we use color coded um, lines to trace out things. I chose blue for PCI Express, um, you know, red for uh, uh, voltage. Uh, you can see in the bottom left there's some thick um, dark maroon lines. Those are coming from the Thunderbolt connector directly. Um, and we can see those are the high speed lines for Thunderbolt. So now we can um, flip the board over, check out some other things. We see the, the maroon lines coming in again. We see that the um, pins at the bottom are coming up and they're heading over to what looks like they're heading over to the opposite side of Thunderbolt. So these may be JTAG pins. Um, we'll, we'll kind of uh, look at that a little closer. But now we're able to start pinning out a little more. We can pin out the Thunderbolt connector. We can say, okay, well these are the high speed lines for Thunderbolt. So let's take a look at that connector and see um, what else we can pull. So we got our high speed lines. This is uh, single lane uh, PCI Express. So most of the other high speed lines are just pulled to ground. So those are out. A lot of ground everywhere else. We got power, hot plug detect. We also have two lines that are called low speed lines. And if we trace those out, those don't go to Thunderbolt at all. They actually go directly to the ARM Cortex. 
So when you plug in a Thunderbolt connection, what you're really doing is connecting the Apple directly to the ARM Cortex over load speed lines. And since they're low speed, maybe we can kind of sniff them and see what's going on. Um, and we look at the data sheet and sure enough on the ARM Cortex, these plug in directly to the UART of the ARM Cortex. So, um, so now we can start doing some sniffing. This is an image of these um, lines being soldered into vias. These are strands of ethernet cable being soldered into vias. Another great use for the epoxy, we can take this, these wires coming out, they're very delicate because this is this very, very small uh, things we need to be soldering. And trust me, take it from uh, my experience, uh, these are really easy to rip out with a logic analyzer. So there's tension on the logic analyzer probes. When you hook them in, if you're not careful, it could pull on those wires and potentially cause damage to the entire board. You have to throw the whole thing out. So um, the epoxy really helps to kind of put that layer over there and protect the stuff while we're sniffing. Um, right here you can see we connected up the I squared C lines to our logic probe and we're going to start sniffing the I squared C bus as well as other buses. Um, and just for scale, here's the size of the wires um, that were going into these vias. And these vias fit these wires perfectly, uh, almost to the point where solder, uh, tinning the wires to put it in um, almost wasn't an option. If, if you just had to have the, just, the, just the smallest amount of solder on these wires to get them to fit in the vias perfectly and then solder them in. Um, once our wires are, are soldered in and our epoxy is set up to protect it, we can start um, uh, sniffing the board and sniffing all the traffic on there. Uh, notice our I squared C connection being uh, sniffed and also our UART connection at the bottom uh, into our ARM cortex from our um, Apple. So here's an image of the output of the uh, logic analyzer and it might be hard to see from this image but basically the UART comes on first and the UART transfers data even before Thunderbolt ever boots up. Th Thunderbolt isn't even hot yet. Um, once the ARM does its thing and gets programmed by the Apple, then Thunderbolt comes on. The I squared C buses start communicating between the ARM Cortex and the Thunderbolt controller and um, device information is now sent up to the computer through the Thunderbolt. So we can kind of build this map up of these, these lower speed protocols on the board without having to worry about sniffing the Thunderbolt, you know, connections or the PCI Express connections, which are, unless you have a really expensive equipment, it's very difficult to do. Um, so we're looking at this UART traffic coming from the computer down to the arm. So I want to know what's going on. We want to know what's, what's going on on the arm, uh, on the Apple, how the arm's communicating. It turns out these, um, this arm is communicating to an arm on the Apple computer itself. These low speed lines are actually connected directly to two arms. Um, so in any Thunderbolt implementation, you need the Thunderbolt controller and you also need an ARM Cortex. The ARM Cortex and the Thunderbolt controller have to be together. This is kind of an interesting uh, correlation that they, they need to be together. Um, so let's grab some Thunderbolt um, firmware updates and maybe we can find some of these uh, strings and some other things uh, in these firmware updates. We notice the string EM space space. Um, Maybe we can find that in the Thunderbolt uh, firmware image and see how the Thunder, maybe the Thunderbolt uh, controller talks to the arm and sets it up. Like, we'll, we'll, let's try and figure that out. So we grab our firmware update and there's tons of information online from great reverse engineers in this uh, field, but uh, on how to get through, you know, application packages and, and look at Mako files and those kinds of things. So I, I used a lot of that. And you can see when we go through our application packets, there's a payload file. Um, taking that and just running a file on it shows us it's a, a gzip compressed file. So we'll just rename it to .tgz and uh, untar it. Uh, when we do that, we get three files. We get an EFI file and we get two bin files. Um, so we have two bin files and the EFI program. So one of these is most likely the ARM uh, image and the other is, is Thunderbolt. So which is which? Let's see if we can um, figure that out. So we take our string and we actually just, we look for that EM space space and sure enough we find it in our HPM bin file. So now we have a pretty, pretty good uh, understanding that this is going to be the, th the uh, ARM firmware, but maybe we just got lucky. Maybe there were just four sequential uh, characters that happened to make that up. So let's see if we can find another um, sequence of characters. So we have the um, hex 270A0000. 
So we'll grab that out and we'll do another search and sure enough we have the same exact uh, image coming back to us. So we're pretty confident that this is the image of the arm cortex and the other is the thunderbolt image. So now we can, let's look at our EFI program a little bit. Um, so for those of you not familiar with EFI, um, the format is based on a PE format. It's called TE. And the way OS 10 does it is they, they take an x86 uh, and a 64-bit uh, version of the TE file and they kind of wrap them in a Mac, uh, Mako file. So just using a hex editor and kind of doing some DDing, we're able to pull out the x86 TE file from the Mako file and we can just load it up into like IDA or whatever. Um, I choose Hopper. Hopper is, an, <laughs> right, for those uh, Hopper uh, fans and possibly the developer of Hopper, kudos to you because uh, this is amazing. Um, Hopper is, um, it's basically uh, similar to IDA except for one tenth the price and has a lot of cool features, uh, a couple of which we're going to kind of cruise through here. Uh, just looking at just the, the strings in the EFI program shows us a lot. We're able to see a lot of debug information um, and tracing that out we can see uh, a lot of com uh, functions being call, uh, being shown with uh, a colon. So init JTAG colon and then some issue or you know read you know read EEPROM colon. So these, this debug information is kind of helping us to figure out what blocks of code are doing what. Also we noticed there's a uh, found light ridge and found eagle ridge and with a, um, a four, uh, uh, eight, uh, eight byte, um, I'm sorry, four byte um, um, hex number next to it. Uh, that is pretty interesting. Uh, I haven't seen anything related to that in any of the Apple stuff. Um, if let's do a little digging around. We have basically two different, um, two different uh, descriptors for that. If we do a little Googling, we find only one file and that file is the um, IO uh, PCI bridge .cpp in GitHub. Basically this lists out if these four identifiers are not the case then go ahead and do some stuff. So now we are able to say with pretty high confidence since two out of the four are listed in our EFI program, we could say this is probably the list of device uh, IDs for all of the Thunderbolt family. So taking that, we notice that we look at our um, logic analyzer output and sure enough in, uh, in Little Endian we see the um, 86, 80, 49, 15 or 15, 49, 80, 86. This is traffic coming from our device up. So the peak ridge that we're looking at is actually the device ID of uh, 15, 49, 80, 86. Um, so let's kind of pull this a little further. We can take these strings, we can cross reference that back up to code uh, and then we can start tagging some of this code. So init JTAG is going to be this block so let's go ahead and name it init JTAG. We can kind of do this with all of the debug strings and start building a map. One of the coolest things about Hopper is the pseudocode option and what you do is you, we are within a function, you hit pseudocode and it compiles it out or decompiles it to a C um, code. So we're able to pull out um, some code for the init JTAG thing. It, it's, it's a little messy but I mean it, it does a really good job of pulling this out and since we are able to kind of put these symbols in from debug strings and clean up the code a little bit, this uh, is the code for initializing the JTAG chain for Thunderbolt. Um, we can see um, how it goes through. I, it does its uh, JTAG initialization, connects up and then pulls this string out. If it's, if it's one of these two strings, it's these types of um, Thunderbolt controllers. If not, it's an unknown one that it doesn't know about. So it only really supports two on the um, Apple computer. And this, um, another good point to note, this is all on the Apple. Uh, these EFI programs running on the Apple. We've kind of switched gears from the device over to the Apple because we want to watch that communication. So let's go back to the device. Um, let's look at these headers. Uh, we know JTAG exists somewhere. We know it, JTAG's uh, being done with Thunderbolt. So let's look at some of the headers. The, the one, the, pack, the picture of the two rows on the right, um, one of these is actually LED voltages. So I hook up my multimeter and I turn on the device and sure enough as the light gets brighter, the voltage goes up. And as it gets dimmer, the voltage goes down. So um, not super interesting for us trying to figure out how this stuff works. So the one, uh, the other one 
uh, in there is for uh, high voltage. If there's a 15 volt um, uh, uh, voltage on there. The one on the left, CN4, uh, that looks like it's JTAG. And I'm assuming it's JTAG for two reasons. One, or actually three reasons. One, it's plugged into the Thunderbolt controller. Two, we saw the code on how JTAG is done, and JTAG is definitely done. And three, it also, these pins also go directly into the arm. So this looks like it's some kind of JTAG chaining that's going on between the arm and the uh, Thunderbolt controller. So I did it trial and error. Uh, I know they make devices for this kind of stuff, but I had some fun kind of playing around with it. Um, switching them around, finally when I run a detect, or an, I'm sorry, an ID code, I'm able to pull back an ID code of all zeros. Um, this is not uncommon, so the other stuff I was getting back was uncommon, so I can safely assume that this, um, this pinout is the correct way that this JTAG stuff is set up. So now we've got four more pins for our Thunderbolt connector. We can start building this pin out a little further and, and adding the JTAG lines in there. Um, since the ARM Cortex M0, which is the Cortex family that the LPC 1100 series is based off of, it does not support JTAG. It supports SWD, which is basically a two-wire version of JTAG uh, that ARM developed. However, those lines are pulled to ground. So it's not using SWD to do any um, um, testing or flashing. It looks like all of these pins that are hooked up are going to port three. Um, and a port on a chip is basically a collection of pins that usually serve one purpose. So they're all going to port three, which leads me to believe that port three has been reconfigured to do a custom JTAG implementation on the arm. Um, it's also obfuscated with a um, start sequence or what's called a, a knock-knock protocol. So um, just doing your simple JTAG connection kind of, you know, it, it defeats this. And normally if you have anything like that, JTAG becomes much more difficult if not impossible. Uh, but we saw the code for this earlier, so we can, uh, we can play around with that a little more. Uh, leave that as an exercise. Uh, going, continuing on, uh, the Thunderbolt device ROM information, what's coming off of that? We can look at our logic analyzer stuff. We see the, um, the image on the right the, where it says HD PAT U3 and it has a bunch of information. That is from the system information or system profiler for those um, Mac users from back in the day. Uh, that comes from the system profiler section of the Thunderbolt bus. So this is the hard drive plugged in and we can see that the vendor name and device name come into here from there, from the Thunderbolt ROM. Uh, the vendor ID, the device ID, and the device revision come in from this ROM, and also a UID, which uh, per Apple's Thunderbolt dev guide, um, all devices are required to have a unique um, UID to identify them. Uh, this comes from that ROM that's, that's burned onto, the, uh, onto that chip. So moving on to the PCI Express stuff, um, we kind of covered PCI Express in the beginning, and now we're going to kind of delve back into it and see how this is pertaining to Thunderbolt now. Um, turns out, if you really think about it, Thunderbolt is basically a PCI Express bridge because it's taking PCI Express information and then it's uh, encapsulating it, going up to Thunderbolt, pulling it back down. So it's really a bridge. And we can see this through a program called Arbor. Arbor is a pay program for Windows only, but it allows you to see your PCI Express bus and get a lot of detailed information on your PCI Express bus to the point where you can actually pick out um, problems with your PCI Express bus and implementations of PCI Express devices. Um, so this is an image, if you take an LSPCI and you do the most verbose output, you can take those memory, um, out, that memory output and you can put it into Arbor and you can see other devices, PCI Express um, fabric. So this is a picture of my Apple computer's PCI Express bus before I plug in uh, my Thunderbolt hard drive and after I plug in my Thunderbolt hard drive. Notice the big bluish purple area on top. That is the Thunderbolt chip connected on the Apple computer. The smaller one over on the bottom left is the Thunderbolt device um, on the hard drive. And then the, the green one at the very bottom is our actual SATA controller, our PCI Express to SATA controller we talked about earlier. Um, looking at the header, the PCI Express header for this uh, device, we see a 1549-8086. So those, those um, 
those bytes we were seeing earlier, those are directly related to the PCI Express implementation. So 1549 is the device ID and 8086 makes sense as made by Intel is the vendor ID. So those um, chips earlier are those um, bits that went across the wire, those are PCI Express um, identifiers. Looking at our hard drive, we notice it's a legacy device. So if you remember we talked about earlier legacy devices for backwards compatibility reasons and as we all know what can possibly go wrong with supporting legacy devices. Um, they have more permission. They can have more access to certain things. They actually have access to your I.O. space. Um, they have access to other devices, other legacy devices. Um, and a fun fact, um, back in the day your video card uh, would need access to the video memory in, in the BIOS and so it needed access to that lower level uh, memory. When they moved up to native devices that wasn't allowed. Legacy devices were allowed to do that so they made video cards legacy devices. And to this day if you see a, a video card most of them on the market are still supporting legacy PCI Express. So in theory if, if the programming was done right we may be able to take snapshots with this hard drive because we may be able to read that memory space of the video, uh, video uh, card because they're, they're a legacy device. Whew, so that was a pretty in-depth look at the hard drive. We've got a lot of information out. We got some great ways to pull some flashes uh, and ROMs. We got some great ways to see what's going on. We know that the ARM Cortex is kind of orchestrating the whole thing for Thunderbolt and the Cortex is required. So maybe we can, and we have a pinout, we're a pretty detailed pinout of our DSL 2210 chip. So we're able to take that and look at other DSL 2210 chips. So let's look at our gigabit ethernet adapter. Uh, we're going to kind of go through the same thing. We're going to take it apart and figure out um, all of the traces and, and try to sniff that. This thing is tiny so it's not going to be nearly as fun as the hard drive was. We're, so we're going to start on the left hand side and move over to the right hand side to see what's on both sides. Looking at the connection, we notice there's an ARM Cortex there. It's an LPC 1112. So this is part of the LPC 1100 family but it's a smaller model obviously. Um, we have the data sheet for this. It's the same data sheet as the one we were looking at for the other one. Um, so that's a win for us. Also we noticed this goo over here. Uh, this looks uh, what appears to be uh, conformal coating. And what conformal coating is, it's a way, it does, serves two purposes. The first purpose is it um, locks down the board and prevents interference. So with these high speed uh, transmissions and this small space we're working with, th that's essential to not have any interference. The other thing it does is it makes it a huge pain to reverse engineer because this stuff is basically like a rock when you're trying to look at it. It also obfuscates a lot of the um, lines that are traveling on the board. If you look closely at the image, you can see if you get the light just right, you can start seeing some of the traces connecting to other uh, components on the board. You could see some resistors. You could start making out some paths. This would be a lot easier if it was just a, a plain green board. Um, that conformal coating kind of obfuscates that a little bit. If we flip our chip over, or our board over, we notice there's a nice big Thunderbolt controller um, and a couple other peripherals. Uh, notice the over to the right there's a um, uh, refer, there's a clock, there's a uh, oscillator. Uh, it's a 2210. So it's a DSL 2210. So we have a pinout of this chip. So now any pinouts that we have, we can migrate over to this device and we can start looking at um, what things do what. So checking on the SPI stuff, we know that that little device over there is an SPI ROM because it's connected to the SPI lines of our Thunderbolt controller we've mapped out. We've also mapped out that the wires coming out of the device are PCI Express lines. So coming out of the connector down this wire it's just straight PCI Express. And we know from our reverse engineering what pins are doing what and what's going on. So we can start making a map on this device as well. We could say, okay, well I've mapped out all the PCI Express pins. These are the wires that are doing this PCI Express. And um, so what we can do is we can take a, we can take this and desolder it. We know where all the pins are going. Maybe we can buy a um, little PCI Express dip connector 
and solder everything in correctly and maybe we'll get an FPGA and we can do a DMA attack through an FPGA. Um, so I chose the Altera Cyclone uh, 4 GX transceiver starter kit. It's around $400. It has a hard IP core for PCI Express built on it so we don't have to worry about writing our own PCI Express stack or trying to build our own um, um, FPGA with PHY um, connector and, and set that all up. It's all built on. It's around $400. So it's a pretty decent price point for this kind of thing. And hopefully putting these all together we can actually kick off a DMA attack. So this proved to be a little more difficult than um, I thought. I was, I ran into some issues. Um, I was going to have it here for everyone today. I just, I ran out of time. Um, but here's the, <laughs> here's the hack soldering job that I did to try and get these wires set up. These wires are so small. The uh, PCI Express wires that come out, there's a, um, a jacket and then if you pull that jacket off there's ground wires wrapping around it and then in within there there's another wire with a jacket and then within that there's the actual PCI Express wire. To actually do um, stripping of that first jacket I used the grooves of a pair of needle nose pliers and that fit perfectly. So <laughs> it was really difficult to actually strip these wires and then getting down to the even smaller wire I just had to use a really sharp um, clipping tool and just be very careful not to cut those thin wires. Um, and then soldering this on, um, there's not a lot of room. We could, we could pull these out. We can use some other wires. I wanted to try to make it as compact as possible and then the uh, end result would just be epoxied so that it would be protected. Uh, here's a bottom view of that. Um, this is going through the process of soldering these all together. Um, like I said, I, I didn't get a chance to finish it, but um, if you have any questions after the talk, I'll be happy to talk with you about it. Um, wrapping up some uh, tips and tricks. Uh, for this, get a lot of devices. If you're going to be doing this kind of reverse engineering uh, at this low level, get a lot of devices. Um, you'll go through, I went through four hard drives and six ethernet adapters. Um, heat up everything slowly if you're going to be pulling the ROMs off of these. Um, I hooked up my heat gun to like 220 and just put it there and I was like, all right, let's go. Why aren't you coming off? Um, heat the whole board up to about 180, 190 degrees Celsius. Wait about five minutes. And then um, if you think about it, the whole board is a, like it, everything around is a giant ground plane. So that's all metal that we're going to need to like heat up to a correct temperature. Once you're around 180 to 190, then you can crank up your heat gun to, you know, around 220 to 250 and, and do some um, desoldering. I actually wasn't able to pull the chips off until I got up to around 300 degrees Celsius. So some of the EEs out there might be like, oh, that's, that's awful high. You're going to damage the chip. But I was successfully able to desolder them at that temperature and connect them in. Um, continuity testing, I couldn't have done all of the tracing of this without the continuity testing. It makes it so much easier to trace through boards um, and um, uh, planes going through the board. Um, sniff everything that you find. I only had an eight channel logic analyzer so I picked two reference channels which were the UART ones because they started first and I said UART lines, six wires, UART lines, six wires, UART lines, six wires and then I kind of grouped them all together so I had a reference. Um, and read all the ROMs and the rashes, that, uh, ROMs and flashes that you have um, and pull out interesting information on that. Um, so again, my name is Russ Savinsky, security consultant at ISEC. Um, I want to give a special thanks to everyone at ISEC partners, but specifically Jesse Burns. Uh, he was uh, very helpful in helping me through this whole process. And Mike Warner, a uh, good buddy of mine who put up with a lot of my crap for uh, the last couple of days and uh, helped me out with, with troubleshooting some stuff. Also, I want to give a thanks to uh, Craig Hefner. I think he's giving a talk next. Um, he helped me out debugging some SPI stuff in the beginning and uh, um, a really smart guy. So go check out his talk. Uh, thank you. We, uh, we, have, we have five minutes so um, we have some time for questions. Yes? So uh, were you able to send custom TLPs and what was the result? Um, the question was, well obviously there's a mic so I'm not going to repeat the question <laughs> but um, I was not, I was, a, I was not able to send custom TLPs because I ran into issues with, um, with some of the wires. Um, uh, 
there, there is, so it turns out there's a step down converter that needs a certain voltage applied to it just in the right spot and I wasn't able to get that finagled in time for the talk. Um, I had the, um, the Altera PCI Express stuff all set up and ready to go to run the attack. Um, it ran in a simulator but, <laughs> but I wasn't able to get the device actually finished in time for the talk so I guess the answer is no. Any other questions? Why not, uh, why not start with a commercial PCIe to Thunderbolt card cage? There are three on the market. That is a great question. Um, I did not know about that. So uh, act actually after this if you want to come uh, talk to me about it, I'd really appreciate that information because uh, like I said, I love learning this stuff so I love taking it apart. So that was kind of the, the attraction for me was, yeah, let's get into this and start taking stuff apart. That, that was an awesome, awesome attempt with the gigabit ethernet adapter by the way. I can't believe you tried to solder those. <laughs> Thank you. It was, uh, it was a lot of work but it, it ended up paying off. Now I can do it pretty easily. <laughs> I <can't. laughs> So um, any other questions before we end? Oh, yep. This guy. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't see you. Yes, um, I'd like to know what is the purpose of the FPGA because you have a PCI uh, bus directly between the two, the two devices so you can plug it in a, in a computer directly or maybe not. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I'll try to answer the question the best I can. Um, I use the Altera uh, uh, Cyclone 4 GX stuff that came with um, Altera's uh, Quartus 2 and the hard IP is, is kind of um, on the FPGA itself so there wasn't actually a soft IP version that I needed to configure. Um, what happens is uh, the Quartus 2 software will actually connect to the FPGA via JTAG and um, it will actually program the, um, the IP, uh, the hard IP for PCI Express. You can actually give it device ID version of uh, uh, vendor ID and all the PCI Express stuff. You can set up the bars uh, to be whatever addresses you want. Um, you can set it to be a legacy or, or a native endpoint. Uh, there's tons of configuration you can do within the Cordis 2 software but that stuff gets programmed into the hard IP of the PCI Express stuff. So um, mostly it's configuration and then um, custom code to, to do a, a TLP. It makes it pretty easy. Is uh, we are we good? Or we have a couple room, room, time for another question? We're good. All right. Well, if you have any questions, you see me around. Uh, stop by and and ask me. But otherwise, thanks again.